Hello everybody, welcome to PlayStation Access. Welcome to the Monday afternoon live stream with me, Rob. Joining us today is Rosie. Hello everybody! We are playing Beyond a Steel Sky, but perhaps even more exciting than that <gasps> is we are joined by a very special guest today. We are joined by none other than the writer and designer of Beyond a Steel Sky, Charles Cecil is with us. Charles, welcome to the stream. Thank you so much, Rob and Rosie. Hi, hi. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here streaming with us, playing Beyond a Steel Sky. Well, it's a real pleasure to be with you, and thank you for inviting me. Um, so, Rosie, you've been, you've been playing this game for a little bit already. Yes. You're sort of past the intro area. Um, so, Rosie is at the controls today. Um, Charles, we have, we have a few questions that have come in from our community. We've got a few questions of our own. Um, so the plan is to spend the next 90 minutes or so playing through the game. Um, we'll be asking you a few questions, but at any point, Charles, if, if, you, if anything happens in the stream that you feel that you can you know, give a little bit of insight into or you want to explain, please feel free to interrupt whatever we're doing um, to explain. No, absolutely, whatever you want to of explain. course. Of course, of course. Um, so I think probably a good place to start then, Charles, is I imagine quite a lot of, uh, of, of our viewers will know you for the Broken Sword series of games, which I'm a personal massive fan of. Yes. I absolutely love the Broken Sword series. Um, but might not have played the, the Steel Sky series before. Um, so well, for those people who may know Broken Sword, um, what can you, you tell them about the world of, of Steel Sky, Charles? And, and, and are there any similarities between the two series? Oh, well, thank you very much for such a complimentary introduction. Um, a, a, a revolution we feel you know, passionately about writing uh, adventure games where the puzzles are interwoven with the stories so that as you drive forward with the the, the stories so that the, the puzzles and the, the the puzzles are effectively narrative blocks rather than blocks for the sake of it yeah and so that was certainly very much um our uh aim and objectives for broken sword and really Beyond the Steel Sky is exactly the same. So it's a full 3D game. Um, there are many opportunities, particularly in terms of the gameplay from hacking, as Rosie's been discovering. Um, <laughs> but at its heart, it's very much uh, a revolution game. This is what a lot of the feedback that we're getting. It's a revolution game in, in, in the sense that the, the puzzles that we have are logical um, and they reflect the game world and character motivations at that time. Looks Gosh, you've gone all the way through the first section. I, I tried, Charles. For you, I tried. <laughs> Look for you. This, it is an absolutely <laughs> stunning looking game. Honestly, I thought, I was like, you know, let's start big and grand. We're in the city. Let's go. And I was just like, you know, the pizzazz factor. It looks absolutely amazing. I mean, one thing I was, key, I was interested in, Charles, was um, perhaps surprisingly, this, this series, this world, predates um, Broken Sword in the first um, Beneath the Steel Sky came out before Broken Sword. What was it about now, about this specific moment in time, that made you feel that it was time to return to this world? Well, this is one of the reasons why I call this a spiritual successor rather than a sequel. Right. Because, um, but the, the original game, uh, as you say, was written in um, 1994, was published in 1994 and was written very much in partnership with a with a wonderful comic book artist and you know a good friend of mine called Dave Gibbons who's best known for a comic book that he just finished at that time called Watchmen that that many of you will know I've never heard of and that. <laughs> sorry it's <laughs> a joke sorry <laughs> of course <laughs> And, and, you know, Dave is um, really got very excited by the original game. Um, he, he clearly uh, had had a, an absolute hit with Alan Moore yes. on Watchmen and, and many other comic books, uh, including 2000 AD, which was one of my favorites. Uh, and uh, I'd got to know him when I'd been working at a publisher, Activision, um, a different iteration of, of the Activision of today. Um, and, um, to, and, and I phoned him up to find out whether we could license the rights. It turned out that we couldn't, but we stayed in touch. So 
Um, when, when we were writing Beyond the Steel or Beneath the Steel Sky, uh, and it sort of felt like perhaps it had some of the elements that might be slightly like Watchmen. Mm. Uh, I phoned him up and I was absolutely thrilled when he, he said that he'd love to, to, to get involved. And we worked quite closely. We had a, a very talented team um, that were brought forward from our previous uh, Pixel games. Um, and what, what I like to do in, in all of our games is apply a sort of structure that you know, maybe a, a film would use. Um, mm. Obviously, games are quite different um, and, and should be respected as such. But as a base, the idea of, you know, the inciting incident and the payoff and all of those elements. And then at the end of the 90s, having written Broken Sword and um, various other games, at the end of the 90s, the, the publishers decided that uh, Adventures were dead. Uh, and indeed, the PC was dead. And so we, we kind of went quiet for a bit. Um, and then... The emergence of um, digital publishing really revitalized the uh, adventure. So I got back in touch with Dave a few years ago, um, and there'd been so much love and so much passion for Beneath the Steel Sky, and you know, suggest, asked him if he'd like to um, get involved with, with, with a sequel uh, or a spiritual successor. Um, and he was very enthusiastic. So uh, I, I think one of the turning points for me was you know having gone to conferences you you know i was meeting people who said oh i love Bro i love beneath the steel sky um and i think the turning point was about five years ago when i, I was lucky enough to be invited to montevideo in uruguay which um you know by by my standards is a very very long way away um and it, it was very exciting to go there uh, having never been to south america uh, and i was talking to a bunch of students quite quite young uh, people and uh, talking about our games and I mentioned Beneath the Steel Sky and a cheer went around the room wow. and it just struck me that this was a game that when it was first released these people hadn't even been born and it just <laughs> filled me with so much sort of enthusiasm given that so many people over the years have been talking about it Beneath the Steel Sky so um, as I say I, I got back in touch with Dave and we decided that we'd, we'd write a sequel and um, it was it was just wonderful to go back into the world of Beneath the Steel Sky, um, look at what had changed, what would be the same, what, what we thought fans of the series would want to see, vitally what people who'd never even heard of the original, how they would enjoy the game, how we could convey the lore from before um, without you know, shoving it down people's throats. And uh, at, at the heart of it, this game is, I guess, what happens when at the end of Beneath the Steel Sky, our hero, Foster, um, leaves Union City and he leaves his AI friend, Joey, in charge. And in the time that's intervened since Beneath the Steel Sky, this idea of AIs being in charge has become much more prevalent and... Things like um, what's going on in China with social credits, where AIs are judging human behavior and rewarding or punishing people based on what they perceive to be good or bad behavior. And, and it, it felt very timely. So the game, this game, is of course about Robert Foster and his friend Joey and what happened over the intervening period when Joey was left in charge. Um, and. And, and how a world develops when an AI, a benign AI, is left with the responsibility to make people happy. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. <laughs> you've, you've sort of touched upon quite a lot of the questions I have coming up. So apologies if, if I end up retreading things you've already uh, discussed, Charles. But one of the things, obviously, that I, I was really keen to ask you was how i'm obviously there's like a was it 26 27 year gap between um beneath a steel sky and beyond a steel sky and you you mentioned there just the changes in the world in general but how have the changes i guess in the world and in in video game technology and maybe even the changes in in what audiences expect from a video game in 2021, how have those elements affected your approach to writing and designing um, this game um, as opposed to the first game in the series back in the 90s? Ooh, thank you. That's that's what a wonderful question. Um, 
Our, our early games uh, were built around a technology called virtual theatre, which had characters walking around living their own lives, and player could go in and subvert the world, and in doing so, those characters would react, and that would open up the opportunities to solve puzzles. So, in a way, solutions were emerging from the actions of the player rather than being hardwired. And in Beneath the Steel Sky, there was a puzzle that um, I was rather proud of, where Foster goes into... Uh, there's a, um, a factory owner called Gilbert Lamb. Now, I live in Yorkshire and have done for 30 years, so why we ridicule these Yorkshire accents and, you know, Gilbert Lamb <laughs> with his, uh, his beaver coat, I have no idea. But anyway, apologies for all the, the fine people who, who live in Yorkshire. Um, but the, the, the idea of, of, of Lamb was that he would, uh, as, as a, a virtual theatre character, he's, he would walk around the world, you could interrupt him, talk to him. But the key element was he'd go down in an elevator and go back to his apartment. And you could go in, as, as Foster, you could go into the, the, the AI link and you could remove his privileges, which would stop him being able to use the elevator. Uh, and that would then allow you to get a card and go down in, in his place. And I, I was just excited by the potential of virtual theater and the ability to subvert the world. And that was one of the starting blocks for, for, for this adventure. Um, and we, you know, we'd identified that Link was very important for the original game. So the Internet of Things, Link has developed into the Internet of Things, where, where you know, everything is connected. Um, and Rosie's already uh, encountered the uh, opportunity to hack into things. And yes, I've done as much hacking as I can do. I love the hacking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless you. So. So the, the, the hacking, the, the idea of the hacking also creates, I hope, a, a degree of humor, because in this world where the AI is so powerful and so prevalent, people just accept that if something happens, if something happens in the world, then it was intended. And um, one, of the, one of the puzzles that, um, that Rosie uh, encountered at the beginning was that there's a drinks machine, and you can go to that drinks machine and you can look at the logic, and the, I'll the show it over here. I'll show thing. it here as you're talking. Oh, okay. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. So let's go up to this drinks machine, get out my little gizmo. And then here we go. We're in the menu. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And what, what you do when you go into the, um, when, when, when you go into this drinks machine is you, you see the base logic. And um, the base logic is that uh, if you have authority, then you can touch this thing and it'll give you a can of spankles, the, the, the drink, the soft drink. <laughs> um, uh, and that if you uh, attack it with a crowbar, then an alarm will go off. And by, here we go, thank you so much. Um, and by moving this around, you can actually change the logic. This was very much uh, inspired um, by, by some of the children's languages like Scratch. And um, I mean, ultimately, what this allows you to do is to change the logic of the world so crazy things happen. And it, the humor comes from the fact that the game characters just assume that if it happens, it must be right. So they're trying to make sense of the chaos that you have the opportunity to create in the world. Um, the, one, one of the first characters that you come across is a diagnostician. Uh, and the reason that he's called that is that all he does is he points this device um, which diagnoses what's wrong. I mean, he can't fix it, but it doesn't matter because the AI can fix it. Fa frankly, the AI knows that it's wrong in the first place, so he's not really needed. Um, but but he takes himself very seriously. So this is a world full of crazy characters. And as the audience, we see through the eyes of Robert Foster, who's coming from outside, and the world has just all gone a little bit crazy. But, um, Rob, apologies, I've managed to completely fail to answer your question. <laughs> no, my so, question, my question um, was about I, I, ten I, questions in one. So. <laughs> well, I know, I know, but I've gone, I've gone deviated off on, on a spiral. So, but, but I haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten. So basically, what's changed? Um, what, what, what I wanted to do was, in some ways, revisit all of that potential. Because uh, with Broken Sword, we, we, we didn't really use... Uh, we, we did have virtual theatre characters, but not to the same extent. 
Uh, and I wanted to go back and explore some of the opportunities. And because the game came out 26 years ago, I, I've kind of felt that I had a degree of freedom to change the way that the game looked. And in a virtual theatre world, because characters are walking around, um, the problem that you have when the screens are static and 2D is that the character will walk off the screen and you have no way really of checking where they are. You can follow them, but they might, might have gone off in a different direction. And so each of these um, scenes, uh, as you can see, are like arenas in that the, the player can see the whole environment. Uh, and often the, there, are, there are characters that will be going around that and the gameplay snakes. involves, as I say, subverting the world the and affecting those characters. Great. And so the ability to show it in real-time 3D um, has really allowed us to bring that concept that was at the very core of the games that we wrote originally um, bang into the, you know, into, into the modern times, which, which is exciting. Um, and another element is that uh, our publisher at the time, for Beneath the Steel Sky, was Virgin Interactive. Um, and it was really fun working with them, and they had a, a, a very wild and wacky marketing department. Um, but what the marketing department came up with, because we were working with Dave, um, was interactive comic book. And, I mean, bless them, if there was one thing that the game wasn't, it was an interactive comic book. Um, it was very much a 2D pixel point-and-click um, adventure game. Um, but... You know, working with Dave, it, it felt right to actually make good on that promise of writing a game that was an interactive comic book um, for several reasons. Uh, I mean, from an aesthetic perspective, I, I, I hope you guys uh, and people watching the stream will, 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 will agree that it looks interesting and looks different and, and hopefully looks beautiful. But also in an adventure game, because you spend a lot of time looking at the backgrounds, because uh, clearly um, you want, you know, players want to see what's relevant and what's not relevant, mm. and whether it can be useful in puzzles. We wanted to have a really clean look for the background, um, and the comic book style, you know, felt like it worked really well. Um, and you know, initially we just put, you know, lines around black lines. We we actually cross hatched at one point, but. Cross-hatching looks great when an image is static, but as a character moves, um, it looks sort of quite grisly as the um, as, as the cross-hatch is moving. And so we spent quite a lot of time developing, you know, this technology that we call Toon Toy to reflect finally the promise of an interactive comic book. I mean, the other big, big, big thing, because uh, Rob, you did say you did ask me ten questions, and I'm trying to answer them all. <laughs> in, <laughs> Quick in, fire in, questions. In sequence. The, the, the other thing that's you know very, very important is, of course, now you have incredible engines like mm. uh, Unreal and Unity and, and others. Yeah. And what happened when Milo's the industry moved to 3D cool. is uh, a lot of the bigger companies, the bigger publishers, developed their own engines, which uh, were so powerful and basically meant that in many ways, indie developers were, were, were shut out from being able to compete. And, you know, in the last few years, really only in the last five or so years, um, these, these incredibly powerful engines have come along, which developers like, Re small developers, indie developers like Revolution can license. And that really uh, levels the playing field in many ways, which is incredibly exciting. Um, because, you know, we can bring games that um, we, we, we'd like, I'd like to think, bring, you know, high production values in a way that wouldn't have been possible, you know, five, five six, seven years ago. I mean, certainly the game looks every inch like a, a beautiful modern game. And when Rosie went into the city right at the start of the stream, I've, it was like a, a breathtaking view. And oh I, yeah, I'm and loving I, the the bold colours and the it. I oh, I'm just loving the art it. Style as well, it really does. Oh bless as you, you say, Charles. It looks like a, well, it looks like a comic book brought to life. It, it's got like a really unique style to it. It, it looks fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, a, a lot of credit goes to Sucha, Sucha Singh, who was our um, art director. And I, I was working with Such um, on, on, on the prototype. Um, and Emanuele, um, who, who, who wrote Toon Toy. Um, oh, gosh, I should, I should mention everybody. You know, um, because Andy Bosquet and Yost and, and, you know, brilliant, brilliant people. Um, but I remember when we first went to Dave, who was also the art director, um, mm -hmm. to show him. Um, Dave Gibbons, 
um, and, and Such and I drove down, and it, it was so exciting to see his reaction. Um, and he, he, he got very excited about what he could do. We, 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 he drew a, a comic book um, for the introduction, which we've animated. But in a way, it was a different style because he looked at the game. Uh, we, we worked together on the way it should look, and then we reverse engineered that, uh, and the comic book is very much drawn to stylistically match match the game mm. um but yeah no 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 it's it's um and and, and the engine that we used was was unreal um and uh, you, you know like like unity it's it's very very powerful um and it's just a you know so it's fantastic to be able to to use this extraordinary technology i mean again to answer rob's one of your other questions of course everything has changed but in many ways very little has changed um and from a narrative perspective um, there, are, there are such, in, I mean, I, I think to work in video games is such a privilege. Um, you know, I, I wrote my first game 40 years ago. Ha ha. Um, and I know, it's, isn't that scary? Well, um, congratulations. 41. For, for, no, no, exactly. Almost exactly 40 years ago. Yes. Um, Adventure B, um, Espionage Island was, was, was released almost exactly 40 years ago. Uh, it was a text adventure. Um, and the it was it was clear right from the start that we, we, we work in an incredible medium when it comes to narrative and the way that we can tell stories. And you know there are huge advantages, there are huge constraints as well. And you know I've I've had half a lifetime of you know really trying to get understand, obviously get excited by the opportunities, but also learning from the constraints. Uh, and I would argue that, you know, now the adventure is is the most dynamic uh, of all genres because it's it's so broad, whether whether you're talking about, you know, more more classic um, adventure games like this or, or, or the, you know, what the, 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 the what remains of Edith Finch or the return of the Obra Dinn or the or all those other, you know, wonderful, wonderful um, adventure games which all tell stories in in a very different way um uh, and a very exciting way well definitely though i mean that's why with each story you do play you always get a wonderful different experience and it's inspiring to see what everyone can create it's amazing i guess also like the um that 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 story is always the core charles certainly of all of, of your games that i've played it is always very much sort of you know, maybe the technology and the look of the game changes and Welcome evolves, but that, that story is always like Where the core like to, to it. I guess, um, how I knew do you feel like, sort of connection to in terms of the stories that you're able to tell, would be my best. has that in changed fact, at all with the advancement of technology? Like when you're prayer. developing a game my now, um, do you feel Make like you've got partners. more options available Certainly. to you um, to tell your stories? The city knew a lot more about Oh gosh. I, I thought you promised me you were gonna ask easy questions. <laughs> I've got I've got some easier ones. But, but you I, I I'm just sort of trying to continue on from that no, previous no, conversation. No, no. I'm, I'm, really teasing you. I'm, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. that's no that's great. Uh right, so if if you think about stories as a whole, you know, the the, the what video games are good at is telling stories where you uh where, where your protagonist interacts with the the, the environment um mm. and, and the threat of the environment um obviously arrived, you know actors can still convey um more it's emotion it's than we can generally fine. convey through our digital actors oh, yeah. and, and 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 often you've got get you know you've got, you've got the medium like books where you can have incredible you know inner personal conflict which is which is hard to convey in film yeah. even with you know the the expressions that actors have and even harder on on video in video games yeah but i think that the key to it from my perspective is understanding what, what our strengths and weaknesses are and broadly uh, i mean for, for for example in 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 any well in a, in a film for example um, you will have what's called the inciting incident, which is what sets up the, the imbalance, the radical imbalance in the protagonist's life and sets them on the journey that is the story. And in, in a film, you know, that can come a quarter, a third of the way through because you won't have your inciting incident until you've built an empathetic relationship with your protagonist, with your character, so that you share the same emotional journey. Um, in a game, because you are um, requiring the player to work right from the start to solve puzzles, 
you need to create that inciting instance right at the very beginning. And that is both an opportunity, but it's also um, a, a, a challenge. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why actually comic books and working with someone like Dave worked very well, I, I think, because comic books... We need to we need to create that relationship very fast. We need to create the inciting incident very fast. And comic books are brilliant at setting up situations, at conveying characters, you know, looking dramatic, um, at getting very quickly the situation across. And um, by by working with Dave uh, in both Beneath the Steel Sky and Beyond the Steel Sky. Uh, and having him write a comic book, it's allowed us, I, I hope, to set up a situation and build the empathy with the, the, the protagonist, uh, Robert Foster and, and Joey, quickly. Um, and, sorry, I'm, I'm slightly waffling now. I do beg your pardon. Um, Not at all. But, but, <laughs> I know, I'm just sat here listening. But, but, but yes, yeah, so it's, it's really just understanding. And, and one of the things about adventure games that... Um, uh, it's not enormously, you know, unless you actually play them, which is not obvious, you, you know, apparent, is that so many people play them together. Yeah. And then what you have is this incredible dynamic of two people both solving narrative-based puzzles and experiencing the story together in a way that is unique, because obviously if you go to the cinema with someone you love, that's great. You sit and you watch it and you hold hands and you, you know, you look at the screen, but you haven't driven forward the, the narrative together collectively. And one of the things that makes me so thrilled is hearing from people who played with people that they loved. Um, you, you know, um, I hear about people who played with parents who, you know, have now passed away and it was another image of the relationship that they have is, you know, at least partially defined by this shared experience of driving an interactive story for yeah. together. Um, and one of my, it's from a few years ago, but one of my, you know, one of the stories that I love was a young man who, who wrote to say that, you know, he missed his grandmother enormously, but you know, when, when, when we did a new Broken Sword game, he, he remembered when he was, you know, a child at school, um, uh, and he would run from school to, to his grandmother's house, and his grandmother would make him do his, his homework. But once the homework was done, then they would play, you know, adventure games um, together, uh, and Broken Sword in particular. Um, and that the memories of that were really important to him. Um, likewise, so many people played Beneath the Steel Sky when they were young and at a formative age. And, you know, the, the game meant an awful lot to them. So it's, it's a huge privilege to be writing these stories that mean an awful lot to an awful lot of people. It's, it's as you can imagine, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm just very privileged to be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, even I, I've got a friend called uh, Liam and I've got a friend who, uh, called Connor and both of them are huge, like, you know, point and click adventure, broken sword fans. And literally from as I've been getting to know them, uh, especially Liam, I've just heard all of these wonderful stories. And every time I mention it, um, then they, they just see the excitement filling in their faces. It's always just a wonderful uh, thing to see. Wait. I do. Oh, I have a similar story of uh, playing the first oh, I, broken sword. Um, yes, I was at one of my dad's friends' houses and he, he had the game and he was like halfway wonderful. through it and I was, you know, drawn day, to it. And I was like, oh, let me I have a go on that. And, and you know, we were supposed arrived. to be visiting, my dad was, was supposed so to be visiting his friend, but we spent no, hours no, that, that afternoon just hooked by this video yeah. game, me and my dad, that like trying to, and we felt like family. we were really involved in it. There was, there's a scene where you, I think it's quite early on in the game, where you're hiding from the killer in a cupboard yes him, oh, it's like a, it's a really it's a moment that sticks in my mind a lot just like the excitement and the shock of that moment um but sorry I, i'm waffling now <laughs> no we're just talking about like our love for broken sword and all these I can things actually actually rob i can go back to one of your earlier questions or, or um and, and and that was about um uh, uh, about you know things that we oh, sorry or oh, Rosie I, I, I beg your pardon if it was you but but one of the things that um that we've actually brought forward in Beyond the Steel Sky 
is just giving the player a little bit more agency over the story. Mm. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, well, I, I, I'm very, very skeptical about people who put in multiple endings uh, into games. And, and the reason is because you spend so much time thinking about, as I say, the inciting incident, what that will then end up in, in terms of the quest what will happen at the end, how you resolve the subplots, the main plot between, in this case, Foster and Joey. All of these things, there is only one ending, and it's really difficult coming up with that one ending that works really well. The idea that you can come up with multiple endings, if you're serious about the story, I mean, if, if the story is trivial and it's secondary, then that's absolutely fine, of course. But if you're serious about the story, then it's really hard just coming up with the one that is canon, that works yeah. in... in, in in, in terms of everything that's been set up. But at the same time, it's really nice to be able to offer the player some agency. And in the, the, the adventure genre, generally the character doesn't really change. What changes is the secondary characters, the, the characters that, um, that, that, that matter, that are important to, to the protagonist. And so we, we, were, we were excited at the idea or the opportunity to give some um, agency to the player. Um, and, and, and the way we do this in, in Beyond the Steel Sky is there are choices that the player can make throughout the game. Now, we don't, you know, we, we, we don't telegraph them. Um, you know, at no point does Foster say, you know, Foster will remember that. Um, right. Yeah. Which, you, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm not yeah. criticizing Telltale because I think Telltale are absolutely brilliant. But, the, you know, the reason that they, that they say, you know, Foster will remember that is because otherwise the player doesn't realize that they've made a choice. Yes. But what we wanted to do was be a little bit more subtle about that because the people who uh, you know, are very passionate about the games, of course they care about the achievements. Um, and uh, achievements can guide the player on the choices that they have made. And there's one character that we come across. In fact, you've already come across her called Songbird. Yes, and she's the, the lady who's just who says, please pretend to be my husband because we're in trouble right now. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> to summarise her. her whole thing. <laughs> and, and she has a very low opinion of her husband. And um, because he kept going off into the night and doing stupid things. But you're going to discover as you play through the game that actually he was really brave and what he was doing was really important. And you can choose the degree to which you communicate that to Songbird. And uh, I, I won't give any spoilers beyond saying that at, at the climactic moments of the game, you will encounter Songbird and her attitude towards you will be quite different depending on whether you've taken the time to <laughs> Sorry, Charles, convey someone, to someone her. Called, um, someone called Revolution Software is in the chat right now. It, it is Revolution Software. Saying, Charles, oh, spoilers. Oh, 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 is that a spoiler? Uh, you know what? That's Wendy. She's terrified. She's absolutely terrifying. If I put one foot wrong, she absolutely stomps on me. But anyway, so I bet it too late oh no oh no <laughs> well it's fine we'll okay. be we'll be meeting songbird again in the stream so it'll be fine okay i better keep quiet now because otherwise i'm going to be in de terrible terrible trouble <laughs> um i'm hoping this is going to be an easier um question for you charles although maybe not um but you mentioned very early on in the stream that um you wanted to find a way for puzzles and story to to sort of interact with each other and i've always been really interested when it when it comes to making a game like this when it comes to making an adventure game like a, a beyond a steel sky or a broken sword how does that process begin like when you're making it is it is it the story that comes first or is it the puzzles that come first um just how does that process work chipworth tell me everything the way that we do it and i'm not i'm not saying this is this is right or wrong but um it starts with the story but then the story is written to be structured so that it will fit an adventure game right and then it and and that'll be a short that'll be maybe five six seven pages and, and then we'll start thinking and fleshing out the sections. And, um, and, and then that'll feed back on in the story. And they are separate documents 
but they will they will inform each other and they will um each one will be reflected so so for each adventure game that, that, that i write um we'll, we'll normally have a reasonably comprehensive story and it'll be quite clear what the main beats are and what the the main narrative journey is uh, th then start working on 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 each section and clearly the story the, the gameplay as it is happening on a beat to beat moment is 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 absolutely essential and and has to from everything else but uh, that is that is defined by by the story and the story then reflects the character motivation and the world at that point which defines the the the, the puzzles then we go back to the the, the puzzles and we say, wouldn't it be cool if this would be a great climactic moment of this particular section? And that then goes back into the story. So, sorry, that was a, a very simple question. I'm giving rather a sort of convoluted answer. But ba basically, it's it starts with the story, and and then we we we, we build on 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 the section design and and the story in parallel, keeping both both elements live at any stage, and each one informing the other. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, I've got some community questions um, that I have ignored completely up until now. I was going to say, now. this has just been Rob it's just, just asking been me all asking the questions. My questions. Um, but we have had some questions come through from our community. Um, this one is, is a very big question. Um, and you may have answered it partly already, Charles, but um, Ziku asks, what has been your biggest achievement or the thing that you're most proud of in your time working in video games. Ah, CQ, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, it, it is wonderful to get great reviews. I mean, it really is. But ultimately, what what really excites me the most is actually talking to people whose lives has, have been changed. Um, and and I, I, I mean, that might sound a bit grandiose. Mm. And it probably doesn't happen in other genres. Yeah, but you know, recently a, 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 somebody came and they, they they collared me in the pub and they said, "Look, I'm really sorry, but I have to tell you, you know, when I was young, I was bullied. My mother died, and I played your game, and it taught me that normal people can do extraordinary things. And I just wanted to give this guy a hug because oh. you know, the, the, there is no there is you know that's that's all that matters. That's all that matters, and. You know, other people make a lot more money, and they might do, um, you know, in the games that they write. And you know, our, generally, our games are very well reviewed, which is great. Some people don't like them; that's fine. But I don't really. But the most, the big achievement for me is the ability to, you know, to really inspire people. For for Broken Sword, people go off to Paris, and you know, they they probably they've probably never been there before. But they're inspired to go to Paris or, or, or any of the other locations that we feature. And they they, they, they love the storylines, they love the history. And yeah, so 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 ultimately that's for me is 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 much, much more exciting than you know how much money we make or 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 or, 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 or even you know the reviews that we get. Yeah. Um and, and that is very, very important to me, yes. Oh, what a wonderful answer. Amazing. I'm feeling, I yeah, I'm to like, feel emotional I have like thing. a grin from, I mean, I had a grin from ear to ear anyway, but oh, you, oh I just want a blanket and just, to, I feel warm. <laughs> um, we also have a question from Poshima who asks, um, when you're making a game, Charles, what, what sort of things inspire you? Um, I guess in, in general, but also specifically when you're, when you were creating Beyond a Steel Sky, what are the things that inspire you when you're creating? Oh, well, can, can I, can I t t answer that one slightly in reverse order? Of course, um, yeah. and, and talk about Beneath a Steel Sky and sure. then Beyond a Steel Sky. Mm. So, but Beneath a Steel Sky um, was, was started in the early 90s and um, a lot of people listening to this will, or watching this, uh, won't even have been born when Margaret Thatcher came to power. Um, but I suspect that almost everybody has heard of her. Yeah. And almost everybody has, has an opinion on her. Of course. Um, but what she did is she really changed society profoundly. Um, and you know, from my perspective, um, without wishing to get too political, what she did is she, she glorified um, 
commercialism and consumerism. advice for me? Um, and, and, and changed us profoundly. It made us a lot richer than we, we had been previously. And Beneath the Steel Sky kind of explores some of those elements. Um, I had been at Ford, actually. I started, um, when, I was, when I started writing games, I was actually working um, as, as, a, as, a, as a management trainee uh, while at university for, for Ford. And I'd been to these wonderful plants where they... You know, there were huge lathes that cut vast amounts of metal and big, big, um, uh, big, big, big um, forges and, you know, all these incredible things. So so that's where that game starts. But but then little little things, um, the the uh, there's this company in Sheffield near near York, where, where, where I'm based, called Forge Masters. And um, they'd just been caught sending um, very, very high tolerance um, pipes to Saddam Hussein in Iraq, um, which he claimed were just normal pipes, but actually were, were a super gun to fire missiles, Scud missiles at Israel. And so, you know, what you had is these extraordinary stories that just made no sense whatsoever. And a lot of them went into the game um, together with the changing world, together with the idea that society doesn't exist anymore. And um, that, that's really what drove um, Beneath the Steel Sky. With Beyond the Steel Sky, as, as I said, what, what we wanted to do, what I was excited by was the rather naive and potentially foolish and maybe even slightly mean idea that at the end of Beneath the Steel Sky, when Foster has defeated um, Link, which the is the tyranny, the um, and again, I won't give a spoilers, but he does, open, um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and leaves, leaves Joey in charge. That, that's another spoiler, isn't it? <laughs> it's, not, it's not the ultimate spoiler. It's not the ultimate spoiler. It's fine. Um, I think if a game is, you know, you learn about if it in this game come as out well. in 1994, I think, yeah, yes, we're, we're, okay. we're weapons free on spoilers. Okay, great, great, great. So, so uh, as I say, what Foster does is he leaves uh, a benign um, friend, AI, who really wants to do the best. And so looking at, you, you know, the modern day, where there is this smell of sort of things. fear of AI, and, and, and I think probably very justified oh, fear of AI and, and where it could lead. And uh, I'm afraid that I, I went back to some of the... Um, uh, psychology, um, sociology that I've done at university and the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, and I thought that was always very interesting. And if you if you were to get a society as Joey inherited um, when, when when the last game finished, that was absolutely destitute, then then, then what happens when, you, you know, to begin with, you people just want to be safe, so you create an army. Um, people want to have the basic needs, so you give them that, and then they want... Um, you know, then they want social benefits and then they want self-actualization. And, and, and according to Maslow, that goes into a hierarchy of needs. Uh, and, and then what happens when you reach the peak? What happens when instead of giving people what they need, they demand more and more and you start destroying the environment because, you know, because an AI wants to keep giving people what they think they need. What happens when, you know, self-actualization tips over and... Um, those those are a lot of the elements that were being you know that we've explored in this and to answer your question really I guess it's just looking at the world and trying to make some sense of the world we're, we're, we're not trying to talk about politics we're not trying to make a point or a political point or a social point but just maybe look at and slightly mock the world around us and would you say that um uh, you would, you would, you, you've been talking a lot about um, AI and how that sort of fits into this imagined future society and that uh, many people are sort of rightly sceptical and even afraid of what the future of AI could bring. And obviously in, in many sci-fi stories, that's, that's a common theme is that, that fear of technology. Would you, would you say um, Beyond the Steel Sky is looks at AI in a, in a similarly SBI pessimistic and, and perhaps nice nervous viewpoint, or would you say it's a bit more optimistic about it? Well, I think it does look at it in a pessimistic, but but the thing is, AI has covered, sorry, that, that, uh, sci-fi has covered this subject so extensively that mm. just to write a game about, you know, AI and, and the, the fears of AI, um, particularly if you want to put humour in, um, felt, f felt a little bit... Um, 
futile and, and, and probably not what we wanted to do. Yeah. So ultimately, this is a game about friendship um, and where friendship leads you with, with, with the AI very much as the backstory that's driving their motivation. But it's, at its very heart, this is, it's, this is a story about friendship, which um, hopefully ultimately is, is positive despite the, 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 the negative view on, on, on AI and, and where it could lead us. Um, going back to the community questions now, um, Future Grown has asked, and Future Grown is, I've seen um, them in the chat as well. Um, and this is quite a this is quite a big, broad question as well. They've asked, um, what within games um, has has most surprised you over over your time working in games? And that could be, they've suggested something like a, an audience change or a technology change. Like, what is there anything that really stands out um, as being like? something that's really surprised you in, in your time working in games? Oh, well, the problem, I mean, from a technology perspective, oh, golly, um, obviously, you, you know, when, 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 when I started writing games, it was for the Sinclair ZX81, and we had 1K of memory. You know, my, 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 my iPhone has 256 million times as much memory <laughs> as, as we had back in those days. But we, we wrote a chess program in 1K. Um, and it played a pretty good game of chess. Um, and, and, and now your shortcut on your desktop is, I don't know, three, four, five K. Uh, I mean, <laughs> um, so, so of course, uh, you know, the move to more memory and the ability to show graphics was extraordinary. Uh, I, I remember, you know, when, when text adventures started showing graphics, I mean, it was a real pain because they took about you know, two or three minutes to load each screen. Um, and then I think, you know, a lot, lot of credit has to go to Sierra um, and to Roberta Williams and, and indeed Ken Williams, her husband, for those, those, those early adventure games. Um, but, but one of the biggest, I guess one of the biggest jumps was, was CD um, because um, the uh, Beneath the Steel Sky, which we wrote on Amiga, uh, came on 15 floppy disks. Um, and extraordinarily people were happy to play the game while swapping discs yeah. uh, you know repeatedly um i mean that one of the questions was game. about audience changes Some i mean audiences would not change. for one moment quite rightly accept that level of friction when it comes to playing a game i don't even I accept having to get off the sofa ago, when i want to change a video game. oh i love <laughs> the charm of changing a disc i love it everything's digital so for me now Sorry, Charles, I've so, interrupted you there. Go on. No, no, not at all. So, so the move to CD, and, and what I'd like to do is tell you a story about, um, if, if I may, about how exciting it was to get CD. So um, but Beneath the Steel Sky had come out, as I say, and this wasn't the, the voice version on 15 floppy disks, and then the CD came out. And, and, and I talked to, to Virgin, I said, we, we could put voices on. And, you know, everybody was really excited by the idea of putting voices on. Finally, the technology existed. And... Um, my my sister, uh, my sister Lizzie's the friend's boy boyfriend, uh, was a, an actor in the Royal Shakespeare Company, and um, he he he. Uh, I asked him, and he said, "Oh yes, I can organise it all. It'll be absolutely brilliant. I've got some fantastic actor friends. It'll be great." <laughs> so um, I was really enthused, and I told Virgin that everything was going to be fine. We were going to get an amazing, an amazing performance from all these people. And he said, I'll organize the studio, it'll be fine. He said, it's it's not a studio studio, but it's as good as a studio. So anyway, I turned up on the on the day, and his so-called studio was the front room of his mate's house, which was on Ballam High Street. And every time a bus went past, everything vibrated, and we had to start again. And he went, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine. This is, you know, nobody will be able to pick up. It'll be absolutely fine. Really? Went, no, no, no. And I'd never, I'd never ever got, you know, recorded anything before. So I just had to trust him. And then at lunchtime, and, and it all went a bit crazy. And I, so I was quite pleased at lunchtime when we had a break. And he said, right, lads, let's go off to the pub. I said, are you going to be drinking? He went, yeah, yeah, we don't have more than a pint or two. Anyway, an hour and a half later, they sort of stagger back. They stagger back. All the <laughs> and, and I'm rather miffed. Okay, uh, we should start. He went, oh, we won't be long. Don't worry. Come on, we're just popping upstairs for a spliff. And so, as you can imagine, when they came back down, um, they didn't sound anything like they had in the morning. 
<laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> it was no. it was it was mayhem. It was absolute mayhem. And we were we were in in the US. Um, Virgin had licensed the game to Konami, so we put all these <laughs> these voices in. Um, which were just all over the place. And thankfully, thankfully, somebody from Konami came back, um, US, and said, guys, we don't understand a word of this. Um, we just don't, the, the voices are just too crazy for us. You're going to have to re-record. And um, so we had an emergency, that's one of the reasons why the game was delayed slightly. We had an emergency re-recording session where, uh, with the benefit of, of knowing what not to do, Oh my god! So, uh, I'm just going to interrupt oh, you again, golly. Charles. We've got we've got Revolution Software in the chat once again, <laughs> saying he means cigarettes, normal legal cigarettes that people are allowed to buy. <laughs> that's exactly. Oh, Wendy, that's exactly what I meant. Did I not say that? Right. No. They're no. going upstairs for cigarettes. For, you for said smoke. They're going upstairs for a smoke. <laughs> for a smoke. Yeah. You said something a bit stronger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Sorry, where were we? I forgot. We, 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 were, were. we were, we were, we were thanking Konami for that's right, yes. um, for, 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 for turning around and saying that um, that point on, that, 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 that they, they couldn't understand a word because people were just putting on silly accents, you know, like it just it was like a child's party. It was just crazy. Um, and but I'll tell you what, it, you know, obviously we had to go through the expense of re-recording, but Radio One got hold of the story and were outraged. Because from, from Radio One's perspective, it was outrageous that Americans can't understand British accents. From my perspective, I wasn't in the least bit surprised they couldn't, because even being English, it was very difficult to understand what these people were saying. Oh, Shall we begin? I love anyway, that. Anyway, I was going. Yeah, I, I that's a wonderful on. story. I've got to move on before before I'm... Wendy um has another. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, no, thank you for sharing that story with us. Like you know, I'm sure it was very stressful at the time, but it's a wonderful story to hear. So thank you. <laughs> I'm sure things are a lot more professional nowadays. Yeah. All is really nice. Oh I gosh, mean, they 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 really they really are. Um, the the uh, I mean, I'll tell you the one thing that is I think is interesting um, is that video games have really driven technology in so many ways. I mean, obviously the CD was primarily for music, but if you think about the way that video technology has um, you know um, and, and GPUs and, and everything, it, it, it's all been driven by by the requirements of video games. I think the world owes us. You know, a, a great debt of gratitude in many ways, but 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 certainly one of them is is the technology that's emerged. And the interesting thing is that adventure games for so many years were at the forefront in terms of what they wanted from audio, what they wanted from video technology, from sprites moving around, from you know from 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 storage to store our our our, our, our beautiful backgrounds. Um, yeah, that's 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 one of the the elements. I, I you know I wouldn't say that they, they they drive technology anymore, but they did do for decades. To class A plus now. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, amazing. Very good. Um, sorry, Rosie, what are you? Sorry, what are you talking to you right now? Sorry, I've been sorry, I've got I've had a I've um in a situation right now just in the game just where um I've had to basically study everything I know about this Graham character who's got an ID chip who's basically in my I've got their ID but I'm not Graham. And obviously now someone's come to ask me some questions, but I've got to pretend I'm Graham. So, I mean, right now I've just been talking. I'm like, oh no, what did he just ask? What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I should be able to tell you all the answers, but I probably can't. Um, what, what, what we, what, right. And, 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 and one of, one of the, the points about um, a, a lot of this is that it's absolutely vital to us that people who know nothing about the original game um, enjoy this and, and don't feel that, they, that they, they've been left out. Yeah. So some of these scenes, which I hope are really fun in their own right, are, are partially there to educate the player about the world um, and, and, and certainly what, what went before. Um, you, you won't have time to get onto it. Or actually, maybe you will. Um, but shortly you'll have uh, the, the, the museum, the museum of old history and the museum of new history. And the museum of old history will, if you choose to, allow you to explore a lot of the elements from the original game, which in the game world was 10 years earlier. Um, and hopefully that will be fun, both for new players and, and old players. 
And what we've tried to do in all of this sort of exposition is tell it in a different way so that for the original players, they hear the same thing, but they get new information and they hear it in a different way. So hopefully it's fun and it's fulfilling. Um, and then obviously for new players, we want to convey it so that it's, you know, it's entertaining and, and, and it feels relevant to the, mod, to, to, to the game world as it stands now. Um, I was wondering, you, uh, you, uh, you mentioned uh, just then that you, you, you might not know what the answer uh, that Rosie had to pick was, um, and that got me thinking. Do you, have you ever been able to enjoy your own video games, Charles? Like after after enough time has gone by, like have you gone back and played the original Broken Sword long after you made it, and have you been able to experience it almost like as a fan would? I, 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 I'm always really worried. It, I, I'm, it's so stressful to finish a game off because it's never as good as you mean my home um, regulators uh, it's never got everything that you wanted of yeah. course with the benefit the of you know a bit of time since yeah. the pc well, of course the console version is every bit as good as i would have wanted mm -hmm. um that did, did you did you get that that cheap plug <laughs> so anyway <laughs> um, brilliant no, no, on PlayStation. Actually, in, in, all, yeah. in all seriousness in all seriousness we we have had um, time to just go back and replay it and look for elements that 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 you know, you particularly from the, the narrative and the gameplay perspective, that yes. could be could be improved. But you know, on, on Broken Sword and well, for Beneath the Steel Sky, I, I of course before embarking on this project, went back and played it for the first time for 20 years and it's, it's really nice to be able to play a game um, after 20 years and and, and forget uh, and to have completely forgotten actually uh, what, what, the, what the solutions are and to re-experience the, the the puzzles now and it, it's, it's all very well me sitting here and, and claiming all the credit which of course is absolute nonsense because you know we have an amazing team um in for the original game i worked very closely with um a, a writer called dave cummins um for, for this we we, we had a we, we had a great team and I, if i start mentioning people then i'm going to have to go on but but you know a lot of the ideas from from the narrative perspective came with came from our writers a lot of the design elements came from the people actually scripting the sections Right. Um, so you know, the the thing about Revolution is that we've always been a small team and we've always okay, outsourced so elements where possible, two weeks, but we jealously the guard the story and the design and, and the scripting of the sections. Yeah. So, so broadly, we, we will be about a dozen people um, and, and working in, 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 in a small um, group. And, and and those elements will be something that um, I, I like to keep a, a very close um, overview on. And generally, I, I I will make sure that you know I tend to be the one that writes the stories and keeps control of the story documents, uh, and then working with the designers on the section design. I'm sure it is. And, and, and so, I mean, to answer your question, it's 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 obviously impossible to to, to, to really play it from an, a, a game from an objective perspective. Yeah, but it is lovely to go back and, and and play it, as I say, you know, a decade or two later, and and actually judge objectively rather than subjectively yeah. what works well and what doesn't work well. And we've just had Revolution Software saying. But of they're course. planning on having you play That's through the original Broken Sword on stream. Oh. And that has got, I must say, a very positive response in the chat. Everyone in the so chat. I, I think, I think, Everyone unfortunately, well, not for us, but for you, <laughs> you are locked into doing that now. It's official. She's a menace. She's a menace, that Wendy. She's a menace. <laughs> um, uh, and, 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 no, it would be, it would be wonderful. I'll tell you, actually, it was so sweet. Jason Manford. Um, I read it. Uh, I see. I saw uh, this. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Yeah. He <laughs> Broken Sword One and Broken Sword Two, and he's such a nice guy. Um, and um, I, I, I sort of got in touch with him, and um, he, he he was thrilled. He said there was so much love and support for the games. Um, I have to say, I did watch part of it and cringed as he got stuck in 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 in, in an element of the game, part of the game that I thought probably wasn't fair oh, so. and i didn't even I we, we in broken really sword there's a there's a puzzle time. called the goat puzzle i was um, gonna ask i was gonna say this, was, this is gonna be coming up charles but i'm glad you've i'm glad you brought it up before i did <laughs> <laughs> lots of people have been asking about it 
Oh, I get so much stick for that. <laughs> <laughs> Rob also loves the goat puzzle. He's I do featured love it. it in many videos here on Access. It's iconic. It's iconic now. Everyone knows everyone knows what you mean when you say the goat puzzle. The goat puzzle. Yeah. I was, I was, I was, um, uh, you know, because video games are wonderful now, and they, they're kind of mainstream, and and and, and we, we're all very proud to be part of an incredible industry, um, entertainment industry. Um, but 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 some time ago, before then, um, I was, I, I remember, it, I was in a taxi in London, and um, the, the the guy said, oh no, I so what do you do then? I said, well, I like video games. You know, I was trying to work. And I thought that would shut him up. <laughs> no, 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 you weren't. I wrote a game called Broken Sword. He looked around me. So, are you, uh, uh, now, when you'll have a go at Tell me, about are you the uh, stud that, um, that wrote the, get, the goat puzzle? And I was actually blown away, you know. Um, but, but and, and, and it's kind of, it's very exciting. In fact, another little story that I'd like to, I'd love to tell you if you don't mind is please do. We we have an incredible English um, writer called Alan Aitbourne, who I believe has written more plays than any other living playwright. Oh wow! And you know he's he's a really special writer. He's he's based in Scarborough, um, in in North Yorkshire, um, and I had the pleasure of meeting him. And he's quite an elderly man. And we started talking, we got on rather well, actually. And uh, he then, as we were going out, he, he's very frail. He said, what do you do? I said, video games. Oh. He said, um, which ones? And again, I said, honestly, you won't have heard of any. Because everyone knows Tomb Raider and, you know, Any idea who that could be? And I said, you know, people broken sword. He looked up at me and he said, I spent so long chasing the clown through that blooming sewer, he said. <laughs> and he said, I love video games. And... You know, I felt really proud that somebody who is so accomplished in, you know, one medium has such a high opinion of game. I mean, a lot of people don't, and that's because mm. But, you know, um, you know, for people who, who who understand the strength of, you know, interactive narrative in, in video games, it's I think it's 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 great and and very reassuring to see, you know, some of the the absolute titans from other entertainment really, really respect our medium. Yeah. Is so looking forward to Absolutely. Um, I guess one of the things about the goat puzzle is it, it was around in a time where, well, certainly compared to nowadays, you'd be able to just hop on YouTube and, and watch someone no, doing it. No, not back it. then, um, especially with point And back clicks. then you just couldn't. Um, but I almost think there was, you, know, you don't Do get I those stories any anymore. I mean, I'm looking at the chat now and I can see people, you know, like, three days. I was spent three days on that goat puzzle. Um, and I, you know, I remember a similar thing. And it's something that you, you would speak to people at school about in the playground. I'd be, you know, you'd speak to people about games that you got stuck on, like being stuck on a game was a thing. It was like a, a thing. It was part of the experience of playing video games. Um, that I sort of miss, and you just don't get it anymore. I don't. I, do you have any thoughts on on that at all, Charles? And in terms of designing puzzles now, right. is it is it something that you take into consideration when you're designing puzzles now? That you know, the internet. Do you try and do you try and make puzzles like right? No one's going to be solving this one. <laughs> I will foil <laughs> the internet. <laughs> so so um, let let me be specific about the goat puzzle. The problem was that. Some people really understood the grammar of point and click games. Yeah. And they would race through them and then they'd complain that they'd finished it in three or four hours. Mm. So, um, you know, I've read, read in some of these magazines how all these people were, were, were kind of miffed that they, they were getting through. So I thought, ha, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. <laughs> so I, I put in this stupid puzzle that is really unfair because we've, we've had a third of the game and you know the grammar of the control system. Mm -hmm. And I changed the grammar. I said, you you know, everywhere else, you, you, you can click at whatever time you want and, and it's clear. But in this particular one, you have to click at a certain point and within a certain time, and we'll completely change the grammar of the way that the game works. And, uh, you know, I put this in and went, ha ha, you know, and I was for the people who were complaining the about the the fact that the games were so have. quick to finish, you know, they were they were quite happy because it added an extra 10, 15 minutes while they worked it out. But for the vast majority of people who just enjoy playing adventure games, they were completely and utterly stuck, as you say, Rob. <laughs> yeah. And um, You got them. 
and, and we got yes, and, and that's right. So we, we got them, but 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 they were then the ones, as you say, who who had to you know talk about it, and 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 nobody worked it out. And then of course a month later, the magazines come out and they give the solutions. So yeah. basically, people had to had to had to wait a month. Um, but it was, I, so, I mean, the, really when we did the uh, Kickstarter for Broken Sword Five. Um, a, a, a very sort of hardcore group of really, really sure, lovely people came people together. Uh, and one of them, who are, and I can't remember which one it was, actually invented something called the Order of the Goat, which <laughs> um, you could join if you paid an extra seven, $7.77, I think. Um, and, and the reason that they did it at $7.77 was because they thought that $6.66 which of course is the sign of the devil, wasn't wasn't evil enough. So it went one above all of those. And um, this this sort of incredible community um, came together. Know, and and uh, to talk, sorry, slightly peripherally, if you'll forgive me. Um, when when we were, you know, getting very excited by the idea that you know people should care enough about uh, our games to to, to 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 come up with new ideas like this. Uh, I remember um, uh, a young woman said, "Oh, I will make, I'll make, I'll make a whole lot of goats, um, but they're very fragile. So can we, can I drop them off at the studio?" So I said, "Yes, of course." And she said, um, "You know that it's a goaters evening this evening." And I looked at her and I said, "What on earth are you talking about?" And she said, "Well, we've got about a dozen people from around, around Europe who are coming to York for a broken sword evening." And I was absolutely blown away because I. So, heard nothing, uh, you know, nothing about this whatsoever. But the community had taken on its own form, which of course it's absolutely right, um, independently of revolution, independently of what, what we were doing. And I found that extraordinarily exciting. Um, this, by the way, is all my excuses to try and deflect the uh, responsibility for the goat puzzle. Just so that you know, just in case you haven't seen it. No, I love the goat puzzle. Like, you know, without it, you know, it's, you know, I, I distinctly remember, I can, I can remember in the head the conversations I had on the playground about the goat puzzle. And it was, Graham it's a thing I look back on kidnapped. fondly now. See, I never did the goat. I grew up with Broken Sword 2, so I never heard of the goat puzzle until actually you started talking about it, Rob. Yeah. And ever since, I just hear everyone say, you know, you said talking about a puzzle and a point and click, the goat puzzle will guarantee crop up. It's become famous. Yeah. Well, I Rosie, I, I do remember watching poor old Jason Manford trying to get through the swamp maze and i looked at it and go and i was, I was going but you should be able to get through that gap i'm so embarrassed that you can't <laughs> um, so anyway apologies for that no no apologies nothing like a good challenge is there <laughs> well as long as it's fair so so one of the things that I mean, broadly, and, and, and of course, you know, it would be lovely to be able to go back and um, just not, well, you have to be very careful if you change anything because, you know, people love the original, but just maybe tweaking some of the graphics so that, you know, in that particular case, it's just slightly more obvious where you can walk and where you can't walk. Um, because, you know, I, I grew up loving, 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 loving the, you know, the Monkey Islands and the Dare the Tentacle in particular. Um, I just loved. But the interesting thing about those games is that they didn't really, often they didn't attempt to make them logical within the context of the world because they were slapstick solutions. But the, 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 the slight problem with that is that often to solve them, you just stumble on the solution by trying every combination on every combination. Yeah. Um, and then you are rewarded retrospectively with a really funny outcome. So, you know, you, 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 you get a monkey, you know, from a metronome with a banana. Uh, and then you put the banana, you, you put the put, put the, um, the the monkey in your pocket, and then you use it on a nut, and it becomes a monkey wrench. And you know all of that stuff is really fun. And there you go, it's brilliant, isn't it? But, oh, I love them. But, but but I defy anybody to work out in advance that that is what you wanted to do. I think it's it's all as I say, and 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 I think that people play games differently now. And uh, I mean, Rob, you were saying earlier that you loved getting stuck. A modern audience 
I don't think I did does. The whole they want. To, they want to move forward. Yeah, did something happened. But at the same time, what we're trying to do in the games that we write is make the solution logical but not obvious. Yeah. And to go back to Beyond the Steel Sky. By including elements like the ability to hack, that gave extra, like, uh, more to our armory of how we create logical puzzles without making them, um, without making the solutions obvious. And whereas in, in Broken Sword, you'll often find yourself using an object in an unfamiliar way. And, and that's how we, 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 we might hide the solutions. Yep. In the Beyond the Steel babies. Sky, because we had the ability to hack, because we had the virtual theater, what one of our one of the mantras was every object that you pick up will have an obvious use. In other words, you don't stumble on the solution. You 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 should be able to work out the solution. And the the vision for this was because of that, if you explore the environment, then and think about it, you will you will come across the solution. You, the solution will emerge from your from from how the world behaves to you. And that's really important because if if you resort to using every inventory object on each other and then on everything in the world in order to progress, yeah. then you, you kind of fail. I think as a game design, you kind of fail because what you're saying is that the player is no longer looking for the world for an obvious, for a logical solution. Yeah, they are They are just wanting to move forward yeah. in any way they can. Have you found that over time you're... Because hey, I look at that. puzzles in video games and it boggles right my now. mind how they can be conceived. Like, how does that process work? And is it something that you find that you've has become easier over time? Like, how, how do you approach designing a puzzle, puzzle? What are the things you have to think about when you're designing a video game puzzle? I mean, I know you've just spoken a lot about it there, but you know, it, it, the creation of them just it fascinates me. Oh, well... I, I would argue, but I would, badly. that we have all the challenges that a film writer would have, and yet we've got interactivity as this sort of Pandora's box yeah. at the bottom, in that we are required to come up with three-dimensional characters, with motivations, with a payoff, as I said earlier about the ending, all of these things, and yet we have to make it interactive which as i've said brings incredible opportunities in the way that people experience but given that people are interrogating the world because they're looking for clues by gosh you better you better get your logic right because if you get your logic wrong then people will assume that the logic is in some way I'm wrong they'll read into it anyone to find it what was never intended was a small yeah. glass and lens. So cuts we devote surface. so much time to arguing about whether the context of a particular puzzle works. But but to answer your, your question, um, I mean, the, the puzzles that are very linear, in other words, you pick up an object in one room, use it in that room, move forward, um, very quickly become unsatisfactory. So for Beyond the Steel Sky, what you'll find is, I, I mentioned before that there were arenas and so, um, so that Wendy doesn't get very cross with me, I'll, I'll just talk about the first section. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, and I, I hope this isn't too much of a spoiler, because it's, it, 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 I don't think it is. But basically, when you come into the first arena, which is the area outside the city walls, there is a narrative that has played out that you will discover. Um, now, we know in the comic book that this terrible storm has come up. And that terrible storm has blown through this particular area. Um, it has broken a bridge. Um, the bridge has become gritted up. Um, because the bridge is being gritted up, um, a, a lorry driver uh, who is delivering um, mini case, mini mini knack bursts to the city has got stuck, and they've gone off, etc., etc., etc. And so, in each of these arenas, there is a, a story which the player will discover, but that story absolutely defines what those puzzles will be and the way that the player will progress through that section logically. 
And I defy any story writer in film or, you know, to, 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 to think as hard as we do about the logic. Because our audience way to get at the data. is so, so much more critical. And because toy. by making interactive, it has to make a certain logic. Hi. That I'm being there. said, uh, as I said earlier, um, you know, we, we do tend to focus, as, as is the case in, in the film genre for the adventure, on environmental conflict rather than, you know, interpersonal or interpersonal conflict, um, you know, which is, which is probably better done in, in other mediums and, you know, inner conflict specifically in books because you can go so deeply into the mind of, of the protagonist. Amazing. I'm really loving the look of this hacking, by the way. <laughs> and I won't lie, I've got to a point, this is where, when I did like a little practice run before the stream, this is where I got up to, and I just literally, it just clicked in my mind, I was like, I can't see the screen, I'll get my hacking device, so right now is me, I'm genuinely now trying to figure out the puzzle. <laughs> I love the fact that you can, I mean, yeah, that you can literally change the behaviour of these things. That just seems amazing to me. Um, we've got um, another community question, Charles, that I was going to ask. Um, Liam C. has asked, um, what games do you enjoy playing uh, in your spare time? And are there any games over the last, well, I don't know how long, but um, the last few years that have really stood out to you as, as being like really impressive yes. or surprising or yeah. innovative? I, 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 I have to say, um, I mean, I play a lot, of, quite a few games. Um, been playing uh, quite a lot of Hades recently. Oh, um, I love right. Hades. I love Hades yeah. I've just platinumed you know, it. it. I love it. <laughs> and um, uh, and 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 I'll tell you what's next on it is Road ninety six, which maybe it's probably quite out of date, but that's the next on on um, on on my list, which I, I'm looking forward to. But um, and 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 I did love um, um, what remains of Edith Finch. Um, and I have to say, I particularly enjoyed the the fish head cutting sequence because it just did something oh. so new i don't know um, I, I was, i'm uh, really I'm glad you said that that's honestly trip. one of my favorite the the whole well, lewis coronation the scene code. sequence yes 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 i thought that was incredible because we've never seen anything like it and isn't it wonderful to you know after after 40 years um of enjoying games on the medium to to come across something that just you look at it and you go i've never seen anything like it yeah but but, but the one the one I'm going to give the absolute crown to in the last couple of years is is actually inside, um, and oh. and to an extent, uh, and to an extent, limbo. Yes. Because to tell a story, to tell a story purely through gameplay and the visuals, is extraordinary because you 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 have to go for you know particularly inside this base fear this base. You, you, you know, fear that, that, that you have for this child and you don't know where he's come from or what his objective is. And so it tells an absolutely wild story um, without any text, without any speech. And again, because that felt so different, I, I, I was really excited. What, what we're really lucky with, um, you know, gamers and particularly adventure gamers is that people love innovation. They love to see yeah new ideas I don't know and, I, don't and uh, I think as long as you come up with new ideas then people are wonderfully forgiving I don't know if some of the I elements are, are probably not quite as uh, you know quite as polished maybe as they should be but um and 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 with with inside it was just this idea of being able to tell a story without any words uh, and again clearly it's unique to our medium um yeah you, you wouldn't be able to tell a story you could tell a very short story without any words or, or, or dialogue, but but you wouldn't be able to tell a lengthy story like that except through, you know, the the, the robotic movement that you have to copy or yes. the those strange helmets that come down and, and grab you on your head or or, or, or or that incredible whatever it's called of bodies and things that comes out at the oh gosh no so that's spoilers again isn't that going to be a spoiler cast <laughs> but no I yeah inside was a I agree. Yeah, I Have mean, you played Rusty, that yet, Rosie? Oh, no, it's so good. Oh, don't worry about spoilers, Charles. Sadly, with my work, if there's a game I haven't played, and let's say Rob talks about it, I edit a lot of the video, so I've I've seen the ending <laughs> to Inside. I know the ending of <laughs> all sorts of games, so don't worry about spoilers. Well, at least for, not for me anyway. For the chat, I'm sure it'll be de very different. <laughs> They've had time to play Inside. 
It's only what four or five hours long. That's exactly you what you played say it to by me. Now. <laughs> should have played it by now if you haven't. That's that's what I say. Indeed. Well, it's one of the. I mean, when I I, I think I've played it three times now, and and. You know, I don't have very much time, so so um, I, I actually I played What Remains of Edith Finch twice as well. Um, so so it, it's only games that I really love that I play again. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, yeah. And I guess sort of like um, bringing it back to to Beyond the Steel Sky, and obviously this is like a, I guess a, a natural evolution in terms of the technology of of uh, what would be. A, a traditional point-and-click adventure game. We're now seeing it in 3D. We can control the character, sort of in real time. Um, what do you see, Charles, as as the next logical step or evolution in in the adventure genre? And you know, what about the genre sort of excites you going forward? Oh gosh, that's a really that's a tough one, isn't it? I and mean, everybody thought it was going to be VR and AR. Excuse me. Um, didn't they? And you know, huge amounts of money being put into so that. Everybody thinks that it's going to be the well. Everybody with money thinks that the metaverse is coming next. Um, <laughs> I mean, for those of us brought up um, on on. Um, uh, Niall Stevenson and um, Mr. you know, having read it all in the eighties. You know, the metaverse, it, it kind of all came around 30, 40 years ago. So, um, and now it's coming around again. It doesn't feel to me like it's changed very much. But um, <laughs> anyway, that's, that's my view. Um, so, so really, um, it's, if I was to say, I would say it's a creative challenge. And it's really getting down. And this is something that I'm exploring at the moment. Really trying to get down to the profundity of why interactive narrative can be so compelling compared to linear narrative and of course a million and one people have written books but you know those books tend to come from people who understand film theory and are just applying film theory um and and and, and it's it, i i think there's an interesting academic body of work needed in actually getting really down to the to to, to, to the base of of why the medium can be so powerful when you get it right. Of course, mm. sir. Yeah. So we've met before. I want sorry, to say, being, um, sorry about being rude about the metaverse, by the way. I take it all back. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I, I wanted to just have a... We're talking about just everything in general. I was going to say, has like the Steel Sky... Let's just say the Steel Sky series, has that been like influenced by any other forms of media? Like, were there any films that inspired you to, you know, create a world for example, similar or anything that influenced any puzzles or anything like that? I know you mentioned comics well, earlier a lot, but um, was there any, like, you know, other forms, of, like any films or anything or any books, for example? Well, 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 I, I hate to say it, but um, Brazil, uh, Brazil is so brilliant. And certainly when the first... Any idea uh, where is, I might find a place called e 1594 uh, Terry Gilliam's that Brazil like um, was... Uh, well, there were two things that were incredible references. One was Dave Gibbons' Watchmen, and the second was Terry Gilliam's um, uh, Brazil. Oh, and then also uh, Alien, which had just come out as well. Mm. Um, so, so, but... but uh, uh, I, I, I hate to say it, but it was it was wonderful to watch Brazil again and the ludicrousness. And obviously that was based on 1984. I mean, genius 1984. And I, I believe that uh, Terry Gilliam was going to call the film 1984 and a half, which probably would have been a more appropriate title than, than Brazil. Yeah. Um, but but you know on the serious front, 1984 is such a brilliant novel. So you like the graffiti? Um, and I think Terry Gilliam did such a brilliant job of taking that dystopian society and making it completely ludicrous. And you know in many ways we are doing the same thing. When's the last time you saw? You know the Jonathan Price character, of course was giving the view in Brazil that we as the audience um, see and, you know, I think anybody who's seen the film will remember you know, the plastic surgery of uh, his mother, his mother's friend, I can't remember. Um, and, and, and the fact that in this crazy world, this is quite normal. But to the John Jonathan uh -huh. so Price character, one's he was just prowess, all going though. insane and he couldn't uh, understand, you know, yes. why everybody could be quite so mad. 
And, 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 and in many ways, you know, that, that is the same. That is reflected by a relationship that, that Foster has comes into Union City and, uh, uh, and encounters these characters, all of whom uh, it's just uh, a phrase. believe in the system absolutely because it's so, you know, it's, it's an AI. I don't God's think that's sake. necessary. It's, you know, it must be right. Such uh, and, 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 and crazy, uh, crazy situations developed. Um, we've only got five minutes left of the stream. I've oh my gosh, realized. the time's flown by with um, all these wonderful stories. <laughs> absolutely thrown. I've also really enjoyed, I'm really enjoying uh, Wendy in the comments. Very <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> loving Wendy in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> She's basically quoted you, Charles, and said, not to be political, and then Thatcher, 1984, China and its social system. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, to stay out of trouble. That's, that's just me. I'm just, I'm just a humble video game developer. Just trying to stay out of trouble. Just let me do my video games. Um, Charles, I wanted to ask, just before we wrap up, um, is and this is sort of like my get out of jail free question. Is there anything... When you when, specifically about Beyond the Steel Sky, that you wish people would ask you about and don't like something that from out from an outside point of view, something cool or interesting or a little fun fact about the game that no one else would know that you wish people would ask you about that you can tell us about now. Oh golly! Um, can you ask another question and then I'll, I'll that'll give me a chance. <laughs> to think about it. What's your deepest secret? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm all through my. Uh, the last community question was about the goat, and we've already we've already covered. We've the goat. conquered the goat. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, so, so 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 if we're going to go if we're going to go back, then um, one one of the things that uh, I, I have to admit moment, I was off balance. Is that felt like I was um, in the comic book. The um, then I when really Foster's saying goodbye to Joey, -like he says, and make sure that, you know, the people are happy. And uh, I feel extraordinarily guilty because actually that line is never said in the original game. And I pretend that it is. An utterly so oh. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really worried that people are going to catch me out. But actually, <laughs> nobody has ever asked me that. Oh, well, I mean... Now they will catch you out. <laughs> I hate to don't, tell don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. It's okay. Just, <laughs> just us and the people on the internet. That's I, all who knows. I guess what we should do, and actually a, a, a good and sensible way to end the stream, would be, um, Charles, for you to, to share when Beyond the Steel Sky is coming out on uh, PS4 and PS5. Uh, uh, gosh, I was wishing you weren't going to uh, ask me that. And I'll tell you why I, I was wishing you weren't going to ask me that. Um, and that's because of... Shipping difficulties, which obviously are all over the world in every industry. So um, the, the game is available tomorrow um, in, in in Europe. And I believe it's coming available on Switch or digital tomorrow. Um, and the retail is, is just a few days behind um, as all, all of the containers sort of arrive. Um, so huge apologies to anybody who's who's delayed. But there's going to be a very slight lag of, of a few days between the digital version, which comes out tomorrow, yes. uh, and the retail version, which comes out, I believe, on the 7th. Yes. We've got just got confirmation in the chat from, from Wendy that it's December 7th for the UK um, on PlayStation. And it's uh, PS4 and PS5, is, is that correct? Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So and, I don't know why um, I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like... <laughs> See, Rosie, thank you. Um, Sorry. Yes, and, that is correct. And, the, the, the PlayStation 5 is, is enhanced over the PlayStation 4. It's got 4K, uh, the, the, you know, a, a, a lot of time, a lot of effort's gone into to, to adding, you know, features and things that, um, uh, that, that, that are new. Um, so anyway, enough of my sales, sales, sales spiel. I should probably be saying as well, we've been playing on the PS5 today. So everything that you've been seeing, everything I've been playing today has been, I've been on, happily on, having a great time on the PS5. The PS5. I can't wait to get stuck in. Great, great, it looks great. so I good. know, I don't want to stop. I've been walking around here for the past three minutes because I'm like, you know, I don't want to get into another big conversational puzzle. And then I'm like, oh, we have to wrap up the stream. <laughs> well, we do unfortunately have to wrap up the stream now. We are out of time. Um, Charles, thank you so so much for joining us today it's been an absolute delight talking to you and listening to all of your amazing stories 
Um, as I said, I'm a massive fan of, of Broken Sword. So personally, for me, getting to getting to chat with you has been amazing. Yeah, I've and really, I played really like it. a lot of Broken Sword too when I was a kid, and I've got so many friends who honestly adore your like you know your game. So thank you so much for for talking to us. Oh. It's been an absolute oh. honour. Rosie, Rob, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, and thank you for indulging me because, as you'll have gathered, um, you know, I love talking about you know fun things that have happened, um, and and hopefully they're interesting for other people as well. So <laughs> that's all I can hope for. I think it definitely has been. The chat has been absolutely loving it. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping Dave is going to be in the room, ready to end the stream. I think he is. Um, <laughs> and thank you, everyone, in the chat. Thank you particularly, Wendy, for, for joining us and lending your insight and humour to the proceedings. Thank, <laughs> thank you, to, Wendy. Thank you to our mods, Oliver Bath and Domino, for joining us. Uh, thank you to Alex, who's been in the chat as PlayStation Access. Um, this is Beyond a Steel Sky. Uh, a sci-fi adventure coming to PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 next week, December the 7th. Um, Charles, thank you once again for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Um, and we will be back later this week. Well, in fact, tomorrow. We'll be back tomorrow we will, with yes. another stream. So tune in then for that. Um, but for now, thank you and goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.